Hello, everyone, and welcome back to class. Today in Intro to Psychology, we'll be wrapping up Chapter 5 on Consciousness with a lecture on psychoactive drugs. So psychoactive drugs are substances, okay, they're, they're chemical substances that are similar to the chemicals that are found in our brain that regulate consciousness and perception. And taking those drugs changes the normal chemical processes in neurons, right? often by affecting the neurotransmission process. And that makes us feel differently, maybe more relaxed, maybe more alert, might make us perceive things that aren't really there. And uh, people do this for recreational reasons, um, because it makes them feel good at least for a short time, um, or maybe it serves some purpose like keeping them awake or helping them relax. So there are four main drug types. Depressants decrease the activity of the central nervous system, okay? They make you feel relaxed, maybe drowsy, thinking slows, gets harder to concentrate, okay? These wind you down. Then there are stimulants that wind you up and they increase the activity of the central nervous system. They give you a sense of alertness and of energy. And examples are uh, nicotine, cocaine, amphetamines, caffeine. This is decaf, actually. Um, and ADHD drugs would fall in that category, too. Then there are opiates. Opiates, opiates fundamentally block pain. Okay, that's one reason why people use them but they also can produce a sense of euphoria. Sometimes it's not so much about euphoria as a feeling that everything is okay. So it could be a feeling of, of satisfaction, of well-being. Psychedelics like marijuana or LSD or ecstasy dramatically alter your perception and your thoughts and your mood. All right. Drugs can lead to problems in life because if you use a drug, you will, if you use it regularly, you'll develop a tolerance. So you folks are at the age where many of you are using alcohol for the first time and your first drink of wine would give you a buzz pretty quickly. And it'd be very efficient, but it's not going to stay like that. Okay, if you keep doing that, your tolerance develops and it takes more and more alcohol in order to produce that effect. If you get to used to doing that, suddenly stopping isn't so easy. In fact, if somebody has a dependence, a physical has developed a physical dependence on alcohol, suddenly withdrawing alcohol can be life threatening because the body has adjusted to dealing with that substance, to coping with it, and will go into crisis if it's suddenly withdrawn. Sometimes people really want to stop, but but they can't because they're, they've developed a physical dependence. There's also psychological dependence, and that's when the person really, really wants it. Sometimes wants it more than more than keeping their job, right? Or or their family. 
So psychological dependence is about those cravings, that desire to, to have the drug, the, the feeling of need for it, whereas um, physical dependence refers to, to a biological need to continue ingesting the substance once your body has adjusted to having it around. Dependence can lead to clinically significant impairment or distress, so harm to self and also harm to others. So why do people use drugs? Many drug, drug use of, of many kinds is uh, so, has been socially accepted, so society has a great acceptance for uh, caffeine addicts. At one time, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, it would be normal for people to smoke cigarettes in classrooms or in offices okay, and to need to, to go on a, a smoke break. But that's changed now. Right? It would be a very shocking thing if you lit up in class, right? Okay, so there are socio-cultural influences on, on drug use. Drug use can also be part of spiritual or religious practices, okay? Um, for example, indigenous groups in southern parts of North America have customs around the use of peyote, which is a cactus that produces psychedelic effects. Here in North America, there is a culture around alcohol use and celebrating, okay, and, and partying. We toast the new year with champagne. We toast successes with, with champagne, right? That's, that's part of our, our culture. We... I went, I like to dance and I wanted to go dancing with my friend and it was, it's been a long time since I've done that. And I was really surprised by how alcohol focused everything was. There seemed to be this assumption that one must go to a bar and one must drink alcohol at fairly high prices. And I was, you know, ready to dance as soon as possible. Okay. You know, I'm getting long in the tooth and I want to I want to go to bed at 10 o'clock and I was surprised by how long I had to wait in order for any dancing to happen it was like 11 o'clock and it seems that the tradition is that people go and pre-drink at home because that's cheaper than buying drinks at the bar and then they arrive already pretty tipsy okay and then start drinking and dancing at the bar but it's like 11 o'clock by the time that happens Anyway, it, uh, I've been out of the game for so long that it, it surprised me and it, it took me back. There are some personality traits that predispose people to develop addictions. Okay? One of them is, is extroversion, is, is sociability. And I interpret that as culturally situated. Okay, Because... It is in this culture that social events are so tied to alcohol use. I would be interested in knowing if that correlation existed in another culture where celebrating and being together and having a good time didn't equate to substance use. Impulsivity is also a, a personality trait factor that contributes. It Addictions do seem to run in families, and you can wonder whether that's because of some genetic reason or is it because of the environment? Are children learning to do what they see their parents doing? And it's probably both, but we can disentangle these things with twin studies. And there does seem to be some heritability for, say, alcoholism. Sometimes people use substances like alcohol or opiates as a form of self-medication. Okay, they may have some 
some troubles, some anxiety, some sadness, and the substance takes it away, okay, at least for some time. And that is an example of negative reinforcement. Okay, a person might use the drug again because they're hoping to find that same relief from their from their suffering. And so people can get caught up in substance use that way. Depre depressants come as sedatives and hypnotics. Sedatives calm you and hypnotics bring on sleep. So people use hypnotic drugs as sleep aids, okay? Sleeping, sleeping pills are hypnotics. Alcohol is the most abused drug in this society. And it's very, it's all tied up in, in our culture. Okay, we have a, a culture of beer, wine with meals, and then using alcohol to, when we get together and celebrate. Like how many, there are, I can't think of many big sort of celebrations that don't involve alcohol use at some point. There's a question from Michaela, negative or positive reinforcement? Sorry, I would have thought it was positive because you are adding a drug to the scenario. Ah, interesting question. A reinforcer increases a behavior. The behavior that we're talking about is using the drug. Right say drinking the alcohol something is increasing the frequency of that or keeping that frequency high so there's some role for reinforcement and the function of the reinforcement would be negative because the drug use is taking something away like anxiety or cravings or withdrawal and there's also a role for positive reinforcement because the drug use is, is making people feel good okay so it's like you take the drug for two reasons one is because taking it feels good and then the other one is that it takes away feelings of anxiety or sadness or, or suffering. Sometimes as drug use continues, there isn't any more positive reinforcement, right? People aren't getting the high anymore and they may just be taking it to keep away the bad feelings of withdrawal. Mm, question. No, there's another question from Michaela saying, I think that makes sense. So the drug itself is the neutral. No, I'm talking about operant conditioning, not classical conditioning. The drug is in, in classical conditioning, the drug would be an unconditioned stimulus because it produces a response, right? Cocaine makes you feel good in the way that meat powder makes a dog salivate. Now, let's say that we paired a tone with cocaine administration, then maybe the tone could become a condition stimulus if people start feeling excited when they they hear the tone because they they expect that the cocaine is coming soon. But I was talking about operant conditioning, which is more like training or teaching people to do or not do something because there are rewards or consequences involved. So 
I'm thinking of how is drug use rewarding? And it's rewarding in, in a couple of ways. It's rewarding because the substance makes people feel good. That's an example of, of positive reinforcement. We're adding something they like. We're adding a good feeling. And there's simultaneous negative reinforcement because the behavior of using the drug, which is the operant, also reduces feelings of suffering or anxiety or craving. So it adds good feelings and takes away bad feelings. Oof, that notification scared me. Um, back to alcohol. People of the female sex, people who are assigned female at birth, have lower tolerance for alcohol, okay? They feel the effects more heavily. There's biological for reasons for that. Um, I believe that um, women lack a certain enzyme that helps digest or break down alcohol. So you see here, okay, that that it's based on both gender and weight. Okay, so so this green line here is the the small, lightweight female person. Okay. And this red line here is of the lightweight male person. And you can see that at the same weight, okay, the blood alcohol level is higher for the male than for the female at the same number of drinks. Now that's confusing me a little. What do you guys think of that graph? What's it saying? Oh yes, I see what happened. I was mixing up the colors. <laughs> I apologize. I was like, no, what I'm saying here is not making sense. Okay. <laughs> because I was confusing these two colors. I was thinking these were the same. They're actually not. My apologies for confusing you all. Lecturers do this sometimes. Okay. I was like, there's definitely something wrong with what I'm saying. Okay. So the lightweight, this is your lightweight female person. And this is your lightweight male person. And at the same number of drinks, the female person has a higher blood alcohol level. Okay, it's hitting her harder. And you can see the same pattern here. I don't like the way they assign the colors. This is now your, your heavier female person compared to your heavier, your heavier male person, they're at the same weight, right, 160 pounds. And even at the same weight, the female person has a higher blood alcohol level than the male. Okay, so the, the lesson there is that the same amount of drinks hits a female person harder than a male person, even if they weigh the same. And if you compare the body composition, of these, the female and the male person, you find that it's different, that the female person has more fat, okay? And the male person has more muscle. And there's also differences in digestive enzymes. There is a continuum of risk associated with regular alcohol use. Okay? It doesn't really, there used to be guidelines around low low risk alcohol use. Okay? The old guidelines would say, um, you know, the, the limits for low risk alcohol use are two standard drinks a day, uh, five times a week for women, and it's three for men, something like that. However, they updated those guidelines to reflect that, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to say, here's a certain amount of alcohol and this is a low risk practice. 
they prefer to say there's always risk. And more, the more alcohol, the more risk. And if you want no risk, go with zero. At zero strand, standard drinks per week, you're not going to have any problems in your life related to alcohol. At two standard drinks or less per week, Okay. And a standard drink is like five ounces of wine. That's a small glass of wine. Anyway, at two standard drinks or less per week, you're likely to avoid alcohol-related consequences for yourself or others. But that's not a guarantee. You could go out one week, have a couple of drinks quickly, get in a car, and then have an accident. So that's not low risk. But overall, at the population level, that amount of that amount of alcohol use would be associated with low rates of alcohol-related problems. But they wouldn't be zero, okay? If you increase that to three to six standard drinks, then you're going to increase your risk of developing cancer and you know, also having other alcohol-related problems as well. And at seven standard drinks or more per week, your risk of heart disease and stroke increase significantly. And each additional standard drink increases the risk of alcohol-related consequences. That said, I like to enjoy a glass of wine with, with dinner, so that's already putting me at like seven. Oh dear. There's an interesting study design okay, where we can we can ask ourselves whether the way people behave after drinking alcohol is due to the chemical effects of, of the alcohol, of the ethanol, or is it due to social norms or expectations around alcohol use? I remember uh, in my master's program, there was a student get to know each other event, and we went out on a tall ship in the Halifax Harbor, the tall ship Silva, and Again, since it's a social event, it's all going to be geared around alcohol. And I remember everyone standing in this line to to buy their, you know, alcohol in, in the red cups. And, you know, before you can start socializing and drinking. And I remember standing there and thinking, I really just do not have the time or, or the money to do this. I, so I cut the line and I asked for some water. And I got some water in a red cup. And then I went out to the deck of the ship and I kind of, I don't know, I pretended I was drinking. And I had a fantastic time. I was doing a lot of silly dancing and getting other people to join the group and dance. And other people seemed to feel free to do that. Right. And I was all like, Woo! but uh, nobody knew that that it was just water. But I remember it felt like it it gave me license to have a lot of fun and be really social. And I recall at the end of the night, stepping off the boat to go home and it was a fun party. I remember valuing how clear my head was. Right. Like now would be time to go and and get a bus back to the north end. And I was thinking, I'm glad I'm, you know, have all of my faculties present and I'm not, um, you know, tripping over myself or, or throwing up or getting in a car with the wrong person. Right. Just like this, I stepped up, stepped off that boat and had all my faculties and then I could get home safely, go to sleep and wake up in the morning without any kind of hangover. I thought. Gee, this was a this was a really clever plan on my part. So you might wonder, those people who are actually a little drunk and and dancing with me, 
were they doing that because of the alcohol or because there were these social cues, social scripts that were dancing and having fun right now? Well, we can design a study around that. So let's say we have a research study and we're going to split the participants into four groups. We'll randomly assign them, of course. So you could give them some orange juice. I usually wouldn't do this with water because people would taste it. So you spike something like orange juice. And maybe it has vodka in it. Or maybe it doesn't. So they don't know whether they are getting the alcohol or whether it's it's a placebo. Okay. And those people, when they when you go look at their behavior, let's say it's socializing, dancing, they're gonna have a combination of a drug effect and a placebo effect because they know that they've been drinking and they also have been drinking. And then those who got the placebo are gonna show the full placebo effect, but there won't be any drug effect because they didn't get the alcohol, okay? They're like me with my cup of water. Well, no, because they don't know whether they're on the, uh, the drug or the placebo. I knew it was a placebo. Okay, and then you could you could tell them that there is no drug. Okay, or you could tell them that there's a drug. So there's what really happens and then what they're told. So you could give people spiked orange juice and tell them that there's there's no alcohol here. And they, their behavior would represent just the drug effect, okay? There's no placebo effect because they don't believe that they got the drug. And if you tell them, if you give them the drug and they know they have the drug, then they'll show both a drug effect and a placebo effect. It'll be a combined effect. So let me go over that again. You tell people they've taken the drug and they actually get the drug. You'll see a combined effect of the real physiological effect of the drug and the fact that they believe they've taken it. Okay, that placebo effect. If there's actually no drug in there, then their behavior is only going to reflect the placebo effect. If you give them the drug, and tell them you didn't, Sorry, so they believe that there's no drug, but they actually is one, then you're only gonna see the drug effect. Then you compare all of these to baseline, which is when you don't give a them a drug and you tell them they didn't get a drug and they're just on normal behavior. So this study design can tease apart the effects of the physiological effects of a drug from the beliefs and expectancies around drug use, which are the placebo effect. And this research shows that some of people's behavior around, say, alcohol use reflects our expectations and beliefs. And we can also see that in cross-cultural studies about alcohol use. Now, I can't remember where I read this. It was in a, a sociology course, but it um, this paper had described how people um, on a certain, it was I think it was maybe a Polynesian island, used alcohol in a particular way that they would sit in a group and they would have philosophical conversations until they went to sleep and they didn't have an alcohol and violence problem until they saw European sailors getting drunk and then acting violently okay, and then they learned that behavior so what we do when we're under the influence of a drug 
isn't just about the physio- physiological effect of the drug. It's also about social scripts. Okay? It's also about social expectations. Sedative, uh, the hypnotics that put you to sleep are often prescribed to help people with anxiety or insomnia. And there are three classes. There are barbiturates, non-barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. Barbiturates have a, a high potential for abuse. And so benzodiazepines are in the most widespread use, but they can be highly addictive too. And so there is a lot of benefit to psychological treatments for anxiety or insomnia. Okay, there's things you can do like deep breathing or meditation to ground yourself when you're feeling anxious. And you can talk to someone about your troubles and about what the best ways of approaching them might be. That can bring on some relief. You can get social support. Overall, right, the, the risks. Sorry, and then back to insomnia. There are a lot of really good psychological treatments for insomnia. One of them being sleep hygiene. Okay, you can set up your room in a way and set up your schedule in a way that you're likely to get a night of uninterrupted sleep. Taking a pill to address those problems can certainly work in the short term. And no, I don't want to knock anyone who uses medical treatments and feels that they benefit from them in a way that contains the risk. But I will say that there are substantive risks okay, that involve developing dependence. So I like to consider the sort of psychological therapies the, the first line of defense. Stimulants do the opposite to depressants. They rev up your central nervous system. They wire you up. They increase heart rate and respiration and blood pressure. Nicotine is a common stimulant. Nicotine makes people feel more alert, more awake, more engaged, and it activates receptors for acetylcholine. And smoking used to be so much more common than, than it is now. It used to be one of those really socially accepted things of like, caffeine and alcohol are. And now because of the relationship between you know, inhaling tobacco smoke and cancer, we don't see that around so much anymore. Interesting, there's interesting studies on nicotine versus tobacco. Tobacco is very addictive. It's actually one of the hardest, smoking is one of the hardest addictions to to quit ever. Okay. It's very addictive. For some reason, it's not as easy as just supplementing the nicotine. So if the tobacco addiction were all about the nicotine, then you should easily be able to re replace that nicotine with a, I don't know, a patch, right? Or by, by vaping it. But that, that can, that can help people who are trying to, who are trying to kick a, a smoking habit. But there are a lot of smokers that will just, they don't feel that they get the same thing out of, just administering nicotine. There's something about the whole package of the tobacco cigarette. It's much harder to get people to be addicted to, to vaping nicotine. 
for some reason, it doesn't work the same way. So tobacco addiction is more, it's about more than just nicotine. Cocaine is a powerful natural stimulant, comes from the leaves of the coca plant. Cocaine is a dopamine agonist. It affects some other neurotransmitter systems too, but dopamine is a key one. And cocaine makes people feel great. So if I were on cocaine right now, I might feel that I this is the best lecture ever. Okay? And you guys are the best students ever. And this is the best room. And I'm living my best life. And I'm just amazing. There are different drugs are associated with different you know, subcultures. And cocaine seems to be one of the professional drugs of choice. You know, and I wonder, do professionals like doctors and, and lawyers do they maybe pursue success and feel like they want to feel so amazing like that? And when you actually get a job like being a lawyer or a doctor, you, you know, could be really stressful. It doesn't feel amazing like that all the time. And is that why? I wonder. Then there are amphetamines, uppers, like speed. And people show three usage patterns. So some people use them occasionally. Some people use them, you know, get have them prescribed for some reason and then develop a dependency, want more, and start start finding it on their own. And then there are some people that are very into using amphetamines. And this category um, includes methamphetamines, like crystal meth. And that's been, usage of crystal meth has been increasing lately. Crystal meth uh, makes people, it reduces production of saliva. It makes people, and so people will... Um, drink let's say something like coke to moisten their mouth again and the combination of um the combination of the decreased saliva and then using possibly sugary drinks to moisten the mouth can lead to severe tooth decay i believe that adhd drugs are also amphetamines Then there are narcotics, right? There are opiates that relieve pain and they can all, they help people relax. Like heroin, morphine, codeine. And these mimic the endorphins that you have in, in your body. Uh, when you're, if you're really stressed or in pain, your body would release endorphins to block the pain and make you feel good. And that can help you, um, say, run away from a predator, even though you're injured. You're not focusing on, on the injury, right? On your, on your bleeding body, you're getting away from, from the saber-toothed tiger. It could even feel exhilarating. And heroin mimics that, okay? Um, heroin easily leads to abuse. I hear, I've never used it, um, I hear that it makes people feel very good when they take it, but then you'll feel pretty terrible afterwards. Like there's, sometimes there's an, an, an upper and then there's a downer. And in order to avoid those feelings of suffering that come after the use, you wanna take it again. And then you're caught in a cycle of using it. Um, it produces very, very nasty withdrawal symptoms. 
So heroin is is very addictive and people can really go down a dark path with that particular drug. It can also cause uh, dangerous interactions with other drugs. Sometimes um, you'll hear about celebrities who die young, you know, in their 20s or, or 30s. And what often happens there is that it wasn't from one drug, right? It's from some kind of a cocktail of, you know, a few different prescription drugs. Maybe some of them are sedatives or hypnotics to help them relax and sleep. And then they mix that up with alcohol and maybe some other recreational drugs. And it's a, a cocktail that affects their body fatally. And uh, there's a comment in the chat from Michaela saying, my ex's dad lost an arm because of heroin use, but I believe it was because of a dirty needle. And I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it is an issue with drug uses that when people get very focused on using a drug, they may stop caring about other things. Like they may care less about taking care of their families, may care less about their job, they may care less about taking care of their environment, and they may care less about having clean needles, right? Anything that's laying around will do. And so there can be infections from using dirty needles and and also from sharing needles okay, with other people. So you can pass around germs that way. And so when societies are looking to decrease the harmful outcomes associated with drug use, they might focus on harm reduction measures. So let's say we know that people are using drugs. Well, is there anything we can do that's not stopping them from using the drug? Let's say let them keep doing that, but in a less harmful way. And so you have, um, there's some needle programs, like there's places where people can get clean needles and drop off their used needles. And you might, you know, there's social debate around this. Some people might say, well, that's, you know, encouraging drug use. And other people might say, no, that's helping mitigate some of the unnecessary harm. Psychedelics produce dramatic alteration in perception mood and thought. Marijuana is the most used psychedelic drug in Canada. Um, I was just repeating things from the textbook about the other drugs without any first person experience except for alcohol, but um, I have tried marijuana once. Um, this was after it was uh, decriminalized. I had a friend who grows it and makes this, I think he called it can of butter. Anyway, I thought I would try it, and he put a little bit in my tea, and I didn't notice anything different. So he put some more in my tea, and uh, didn't really notice anything either. And then, I'm not sure if it was maybe an hour later, it hit me like a train, and that was really not good experience. I would never do that again. But what I distinctly remember was the distortion in my perception. It felt like there was, I don't know, it's even hard to explain. How do I explain it? It felt like there was a tunnel. There was something, some kaleidos, a dark tunnel with some kind of kaleidoscopic property. It felt like it was moving around. Um, and it was quite, I remember being quite frightened because um, I have I have type 1 diabetes and at the same time I was getting a low blood sugar, but I didn't have the ability to treat the low, like normally get a low blood sugar, eat some sugar, okay, done, because I had kind of lost control of my body. I was just laying in the grass. Anyway, it was not a good moment for me and uh, I have not, not repeated that. I, I hear that marijuana has different effects if it's um, eaten or smoked. And that was an edible. 
anyway, I think that that's my last experiment with uh, with psychoactive drugs because in at least in my case, it's really important that uh, I can control my my blood glucose levels at all times. So I'm not I'm not going to be taking any more risks like that. Anyway. Um, as you know, it was it's been legalized and you can get it at the NSLC at the Liquor Commission in, in Nova Scotia. I don't know about New Brunswick. And so and Gabrielle says, I'm also type one diabetic and find that wheat makes my blood sugars go down. I, I did not like the combination of of low and and, and sort of out of my mind somehow. That was that was a really bad place. These low blood sugars are not fun, and it it really enhanced the feelings of anxiety that that go along with it. Um, so its subjective effects are due to THC tetrahydrocannabinol. I hope, and you'll you'll remember anandamide, right? Anandamide is a neurotransmitter that's associated with feelings of bliss. And the physiological effects include like an increase in heart rate, uh, red eyes, glazed over eyes, makes you want to snack. And uh, chronic use does seem to impair kind of cognitive function and motivation, but it's reversible if you stop using it. Uh, there was a time at which there was a lot of tolerance for, well, I mean, there is a lot of tolerance for alcohol, but there was like very little tolerance for marijuana when it was criminalized. And healthcare providers would point out that the risks and the harms of, of alcohol and of tobacco seemed so much greater than, than that of, of marijuana. And yet we were banning that one. And you might wonder why we criminalize some things and not others. I one of the things I see a lot of in in professional life is uh, people breaking the law with things like uh, defamation, spreading malicious rumors, that kind of backstabbing, office politics stuff. That's not criminal. Kind of like the ways that that white, I don't know. I'd say upper middle class white professionals hurt each other, cause harm um, that are actually illegal, like def defamations illegal seem to be not criminal. Right. If you ever followed up on something like that, it's it's not a police matter. It's civil. It's a matter of a lawsuit that gets settled in money. So it's interesting what things we as a society choose to criminalize and make police matters that you can get thrown in a, a cell for. Because I'll say that in my own professional life, I see people doing things that are very upsetting and, and quite harmful that just don't don't tick those boxes, don't get you hauled away. LSD has a, you know, it's a drug associated with uh, like the 1960s culture. It produces feelings of you ha that you're having clear thoughts, but that can be almost synesthetic. Right? Like a, a friend of mine, I think, used it, and she said that she was just like looking at furniture and watching. It was it looked like the paint was like running off them. Okay, so you have some. There's some interesting changes in sensation and perception. You know, maybe feeling things that that aren't there, seeing things that aren't there, and that may have something to do with an effect on the serotonin system. At one point, it was of great interest to the CIA as some kind of mind control drug or truth serum, and they did some experiments that were not particularly ethical in administering it to people who didn't know they were getting it and and you know, watching what they did, and uh, it, you know, caused some. There was a, a tragic consequence. There was some officer or agent of some kind who threw himself out a window and fell to his death. So, 
they canceled the program after that. And there is no no such thing as a truth serum. You can imagine that would be really convenient for any kind of law enforcement official. Just give somebody some drug and then ask them what happened or what was going on and they'll tell you. So there was hope for that, but it didn't work. Ecstasy was associated with party culture in the 1990s. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. I'm not really on the drug scene. Um, it's a stimulant and also a hallucinogenic. And it triggers a release of huge amounts of serotonin. It makes people feel good. Um, make them feel confident and it makes them want to connect with others like there's a, a lovey kind of feeling or so I hear. Unfortunately to you know every up there's there's a down and ecstasy has a an unpleasant downer where you know people can feel very depressed and it can also damage the the neurons that rely on on serotonin. All right, we are at 1020, and this is the end of the slide deck. Our next chapter, we're due to start our next chapter on Wednesday. I was supposed to finish, supposed to finish this lecture on Monday. I'm thinking let's forge ahead with our last chapter on Monday because it's a longer chapter, and I want to make sure I have enough time to get through it, and then... If there's any time remaining at the end of the class, maybe we can have a final review session. Thank you for your attention. I'll um, stop the recording now if there are any questions.